Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Buddhang dhammang sanggang gunutarang upacayang namasami have a period now maybe of 25 minutes or so of some dhamma reflections and then we'll open it up to questions and I'll have things a bit more interactive this month uh, our theme uh, has been the six sense bases the salayatana uh, which are the eyes and the ears the nose the tongue the body and the mind and the mind isn't anything uh, supernatural it's not like uh, what's his name Bruce Willis in sixth sense the sixth sense in Buddhism is just uh, just the mind just the capacity to, to know and the Buddha talked about these a lot this is one of his frameworks for uh, helping us shift the narrative that we have about our life uh, so much of the time, we just have this me, 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 drama, I, me, mine, just over and over. Uh, this is so-and-so in relationship to me, and I am this in relationship to her and to him. And it can get complicated, because a lot of it is just made up based on uh, stories that we've gotten from other people or from tiny little interactions and so much of the, the Buddhist teachings, the Dhamma, is about just shifting to a less personalized and less self-based um, story, a less, less self-based uh, churning that we compulsively uh, seem to be addicted to. And these six sense bases uh, and their objects are one different way that we can look at our experience, which is less uh, yeah, it's less like a play. It's it has it's less fiery. It's it's much more cool. Um, so we've got the eyes and what we look at, which is sights. And we've got the ear and sounds, the nose and smells, tastes and touch, and uh, sorry, tastes and uh, body and touch and mind and thoughts. Uh, and that's much simpler. It's a a much less complex story. Um, there's one book of the Buddha's teachings called the Salayatana Vaga, uh, which is all about these six sense bases, and he's got about almost 200 discourses there. And uh, one thing which he recommends in relationship to our uh, our own relationship with the eye and the ears and the nose and the tongue and the body and the mind is three qualities. So we should uh, relate to the eyes so as to give rise to nibida, viraga, and niroda. Okay, we look at the ears and sounds so as to give rise to nibida, viraga, niroda. The nose so as to give rise to nibida, viraga, niroda. And that's a bunch of poly to hopefully get everybody excited to be like, what is it? What is it? How do we? How do we look at these things? Um, and those terms are really useful to to try to get our, our minds around. And it's basically about chilling out and, and cooling. So nibida can be translated as uh, disenchantment, uh, viraga as dispassion, and niroda as um, stopping, stopping, uh, or even cessation. Um, and so we look at, we relate to our visual, our visual field so as to uh, not be enchanted by it. Um, and here it's, the Buddha is talking about not so much kind of the modern, um, yeah, I mean, there's a, a positive way that many of us conceive of enchantment. You know, we live in this enchanting world and we go out to the forest and we go camping so as we can know the enchantment of uh, the beauty of the world. And uh, there is a place for being, for the beauty of the world and to appreciate that. 
Uh, but here the Buddha is talking about the enchant enchantment or the, um, yeah, the whole layer of perceptions that we add on to the world, which are not actually, uh, not actually true, or not actually in line with the way things are. So, so much of the time we, the way that we're looking and the things that we see, it's not we're not seeing in line with the the way things actually are. But we've got this whole other, um, yeah, somewhat illusory fantasy, like fantasia that we paste over our uh, experience of, of sights. And we've been looking, you know, just basically in line with what looks good and, you know, looking away from the things that look bad. And that's natural, you know, all sorts of animals in the animal kingdom, that's what animals do. We just, you don't want to look at the things you don't want to look at and you uh, look at the things you want to look at. and. Um, that's, that is what it is, but it becomes problematic um, because uh, if we look in um, unintelligent or if we uh, stare at things which are inappropriate to stare at, uh, then it can cause problems for ourselves and cause problems for the people around us and uh, it can be annoying as well uh, for ourselves and for the, the people around us. Um, I was on a ferry, so Tanisbo and I take ferries around the area we live out on Southworth and take a lot of ferries and some people will see us and we're dressed weird and we've got uh, unusual haircuts and sometimes we don't have eyebrows, so sometimes people will come up to us and uh, ask us about what we're doing. So earlier this week, um, this gentleman comes up, he's a, an American guy, but he starts, comes up to us and says, oh, uh, in Thai, he says, oh, do you, do you speak Thai? Are you Thai monks? And we said, uh, yeah, we are. We're, we're Thai monks. And we have a start a nice conversation with him. And I continue the conversation inside the boat. We're sitting uh, across the bench from each other. And it turns out that he's a um, post-doctorate. I mean, he's in his 60s and, um, you know, had uh, studied quantum mechanics and a, obviously a really smart guy. And our conversation was about like self-driving boats, which I didn't know was a thing. But as we're talking, you know, we're across the, the table from one another. And as we're talking, and honestly, he's, he's doing most of the talking and I'm just kind of listening, um, which, because it's, it's interesting. And also because, um, yeah, he was talking a lot. So, um, but as he's, he's talking, you know, he'll be talking and, and then I'm kind of looking directly at him. But any time a woman kind of passed by us, his eyes, it was like, uh, it was like untrained gerbils, you know, just like, <laughs> we'll go over and just like stare at them. You know, it didn't matter their age, it seemed like. It didn't matter like, you know, how revealing or unrevealing their clothes were. It was just, we'd be talking, I was over here, and we're like you know, looking at each other, and then a woman passes by, and it's just totally shifted over. And somehow he was able to keep up the conversation, but it was like such a, a clear instance of just uh, yeah, somebody who <laughs> had just not put any effort or seemed like uh, intention into uh, training the eyes, you know, training this, this visual field and paying attention to, um, yeah, I imagine if I'd been any of those women, it would have been annoying. Um, and even for me, it was a little bit annoying um, just to, to see him constantly kind of shifting over. Um, but yeah, that's kind of what we all do to some extent, and uh, it can be healthy to, um, yeah, train ourselves away from that so as to not be, really be a slave to whatever we want to look at and be a slave to whatever we don't want to look at. Um, so this is just one example with the eyes, and it's the same with the, the ears and our the sounds we hear, we want to be able to train towards disillusionment. This is the, the nibida. Uh, that bid, that's in Sanskrit, you've got different roots. So bid comes from vid, which means to either to search or to, to, to know. So you've got uh, ni is like to put down. So we practice for nibida of the eyes, for putting down the search, basically. We give up the search, basically we find contentment inside. That's what we're looking for. Like it's not like, 
the Buddha didn't say, it's not that the, the world is a problem, really. There's a beautiful verse, uh, which in English can be translated as, uh, uh, all, there are all these pretty things in the world, uh, but the pretty things of the world remain just as they are. That's not sensuality. The pretty things remain just as they are, but the wise remove desire and attachment for them. So it's not the beautiful or repulsive things that we see, that's the problem. It's our own relationship to those things. So we wanna be able to put down that search and that's, that's where like stilling and happiness and coolness can really be found. Um, so no diss to the world, um, but it's really, uh, and yeah, this is not a path of um, uh, just self-flagellation and more and more suffering. Um, it's really a path of greater and greater happiness, finding more and more subtle, less and less harmful ways of enjoyment, really, uh, leading to higher and higher, more and more subtle levels of, of happiness. Um, and to get to these subtler and more solid and more grounded levels of, of happiness, we have to let go of things. And it's like any kind of um, addiction that we have. You know, if we want to get rid of that addiction, we need something better to feed on, yeah? So it's, this is what meditation is about. This is what um, generosity is all about. You know, just giving up, all you have to do to give something is to just let go. And this is what morality is about. You're just giving up, um, yeah, the things that, if the Buddha said, you know, if by giving up a lesser happiness or a lesser pleasure, you realize a greater pleasure, a greater happiness, then a wise person would let go of those lesser, more coarse happiness and pleasures so as to realize a greater one. And this is for anyone who's known uh, drug addiction in this life, um, you know this. Like any time, if you've remained sober or you know, haven't smoked for however long, it's a challenge to start off with. Um, but then over time, you just get used to it and you don't even want, you know, 10 years after smoking, it might come to a place where you don't even, I don't even want a cigarette anymore. Um, and it's the same with these other kind of addictions. Like, I don't even want to, uh, you know, uh, follow my eyes in, in this direction or that direction. It's, um, you know, I don't want to uh, be addicted to this thing or that thing. And so, yeah, it's a process of kind of de-addicting ourselves from these things, from letting go of the, the search. And the next term, what we practice towards is viraga. So um, raga is passion. Um, and another better translation, because passion is also something which many Americans, we want. You know, like, I want to be passionate about the causes that I'm passionate about. I want to be passionate about the Buddha Dhamma. And there is a place for that, you know, having a love for the Dhamma, having love for the teachings, having love for being a generous person, having love for having morals, clear principles of integrity, that's a great thing. But this passion is more like infatuation. And we want to practice and look and hear in a way which doesn't give rise to infatuation, but it's just cooling, just more and more cooling and just letting go, uh, just letting us become more and more cool. Um, yeah, this is actually a synonym for Nibbana or Nirvana. Uh, one translation of uh, Van there, of the Nirvana, is basically a burning. And Nirvana, Nibbana, is the going out of a flame. So it's like the coolness, the coolness of Nibbana. Um, this morning I was thinking about Nibbana and uh, realized that I've been living in monasteries for about 15 years, so I actually don't know what's cool these days. So I had to do a, a Google search uh, for what, what is cool. And I have to say, I mean, you guys gotta do better. Um, I got a list of the 30 coolest things. It was, it was 2018, so it's a little bit outdated, but the number one coolest thing was reusable coffee mugs. I'm like, come on, guys, you can, you can do better than that. Um, also on the list was beards, and 
I know these days people like rappers with the name Little Lil before it. That's popular. That's cool. Um, but uh, yeah, in terms of like even cooler, you know, the uh, the coolness of Nibbana, the coolness of an Arahant, someone who's actually enlightened. This is you need a different word. You know, they're utterly cool. Uh, one of our, our teachers from Thailand, uh, Lumpur Liam, was visiting uh, Abayagiri about 10 years ago. And uh, one of the gentlemen I was uh, living there with at the time, he would watch Lumpur Liam, who's this very, uh, very composed monk, who's just extremely cool, extremely cool monk, but um, just so non-attached to to anyone like you have a conversation with him and his eyes might just be you know staring down at the floor all the time and it's not the case that he's like fully detached and has no heart you know when he looks up his just eyes are just filled with metta and he just surrounds you with this uh this globe of of warmth um but yeah one of my friends there was just saying that Lumpur Liam reminded him of Miles Davis you know somebody who's just totally cool in the sense of totally untouched by by praise and blame. And this is the type of coolness that, that we want, you know, something which is not inflamed, you know, raga. Um, the word raga, in addition to meaning impassioned or infatuated, literally it's, it's cognate with the English word like rouge, like the red stuff that some people put on their face, or like rage even. So rage or rouge, you know, it's a, it's a coloring, it's a dye. And basically, viraga is the opposite of that. So it's like taking off the rose-colored glasses and seeing things as they are. So uh, we want to, um, yeah, see the see the world clearly, uh, as opposed to uh, getting all infatuated and fevered and just all up in a a, a flame with um, the things that we want and setting on fire the things that we we don't want and don't like, the things that we hate, and really just giving that full fuse and full uh, full heat. Uh, and the final term is niroda, and that's like a stopping. It's like a car which has no brakes. And near, again, ni means to put down. So like you're putting on the brakes, you're putting on the brakes, you're stopping the, the momentum, the unhealthy, the unhelpful momentum of our unhealthy habits. And you're just putting it down. Like I don't need to, uh, I don't need to go outside. I don't need to send the mind outside to know like contentment within. Um, there's a really neat term uh, which is used in psychological psychology circles these days, which is called the hedonic treadmill. So this is um, like a treadmill. It's for anyone who's been addicted or you know to drugs, alcohol, cigarettes, whatever, food. You know this. Basically, that object is not going to be satisfying. You get it and you just want more. It's like a, head, a treadmill that just keeps on going. You're not getting anywhere. You're just spinning the wheels. You just keep on walking. It's like that the donkey. I don't know if this is a real thing, but like a donkey who's got a stick over his head with the carrot, and he's just constantly chasing the carrot. And this is the hedonic treadmill. And with sensual pleasures, it's never going to be satisfying. We'll just be chasing uh, that milkshake for the rest of our life. You know, We'll be chasing that cigarette until we're able to like put it down and really just like have a coolness inside. I don't need the milkshake. I don't need the cheesecake. You know, like I've got inner cheesecake, as they say. <laughs> um, but, you know, this, this hedonic treadmill, it's almost like, you know, modern treadmills, they've got like the upward incline. But this hedonic treadmill is almost like the opposite. It's like you're on a treadmill that's going down and you're gaining momentum. And this is what happens with addiction. And this is what it means to like hit rock bottom. You're on this downward facing treadmill and you're gonna hit bottom, you know, and that's really gonna hurt. You're going faster and faster downhill on a treadmill. So that's sensuality, the kind of self-perpetuating addiction cycle. But then there's the opposite and this is what the path of the Buddha, you can think of it as like the uh, renunciate treadmill or the simplicity treadmill. And this is a treadmill which is slightly inclined. It's, it takes some effort, you know, it takes some effort to, to give up the things that, that we think we love 
and we, we think are the only source of gratification. If I give up, you know, drinking, then life is gonna suck and it's gonna be super boring and I'm gonna be like, you know, one of those boring people. Um, but yeah, it takes some effort. You have to readjust your perceptions of the world, but it's, it's like one of these um, non-motorized or uh, like manual treadmill which actually is just working by the base of your, your steps. It doesn't have a motor on it. You know, so there are these treadmills you can put under your desk and you just like walk and it moves with you, but it'll eventually stop. If you stop putting effort forward, then it will stop as well. And that's like the renunciate treadmill. It's basically you have to put effort towards giving these things up. Okay, I'm not gonna hang out with those friends who basically just do all these things I don't wanna do. And I'm not going to buy this thing from the store, which I know I'm going to consume and I know is just going to cause me suffering. So it takes some effort. You've got to do that walking. But on this, this path of dharma, you get to a place where, yeah, it takes some effort, but there is a place of stillness and you can actually just like sit down eventually. The momentum just, just stops and uh, you don't need to keep going. The rolling, that momentum just stops and you can just sit down, sit down on the treadmill and be fully content, and it's like a, a meditation retreat. You go to a meditation retreat, and they take away everything that you love. You know, you can't have a computer, so you, you know, can't watch YouTube, can't watch Netflix, can't watch all the things I want to see. They say, okay, no iPad, no iPods, or whatever people listen to music on these days. Like, none of that. You can't listen to the things you want to listen to. Um, you can only eat before noon. That sucks, you know. Um, you have to sleep on a, a you know, shallow or a, a not high bed. So you take away the physical pleasure to some extent. Um, you're with a roommate and they might not smell the way that you want things to smell. Um, and you can't have books. You know, you're basically just watching the breath, much more simple existence. And you find it's like, you know, a detox period. The first couple days of a 10 day meditation retreat or really it's almost like the first third of any kind of meditation re retreat. If it's a day, it's like the first three hours. If it's 10 days, it's the first three days. A month, it's the first month. But it takes a while to like detox from our obsession of consuming sight, sound, smell, taste, touch, ideas. But then after that, you find something fascinating. It's like, I can actually just sit and be totally content. And this content is not a dumb content. It's a content which is fully satisfied in a way which I've never felt by just eating more pancakes, basically. Um, it's a contentment which feels categorically different. And this is the happiness of the, the Buddhist path. It's a path of a happiness of, of letting go. And I don't need these things to feel a brightness inside and a, a warmth inside. And uh, that's what sense restraint is all about. And if we can see things, okay, it's not my story. This person is what to me, I'm that to him and her. Um, it's just, okay, eyes seeing forms, ears hearing sounds, nose smelling odors, aromas, tongue tasting flavors, body touching tangible objects, and the mind knowing thoughts. And it's just that simple and that, um, yeah, there's no fire there. And we can practice towards uh, letting go and towards disenchantment and just being cool. I mean, don't you want to be like cool and chill and not strung out. Um, so maybe in the talk there and we can open things up to questions. So we can open things up to questions, and uh, we've also got maybe people zooming on Zoom or in YouTube. Yeah, yeah. Do we have a mic runner? You can run a mic. Yeah, it can be questions about um, what we were talking about this morning, or, the, or your own meditation, or just really anything.
Hi. Okay. <laughs> My question is about mudita. Um, oftentimes, mudita will arise very spontaneously for me, and it feels so, so wonderful. Um, and other times, I feel like, like particular this week, I've been noticing like more more enemies of mudita arising, like jealousy, um, particularly around um, just how badly I want to go back to monasteries and practice for months. And um, I would rather feel, uh, yeah, feel mudita for people who are getting to do that right now. And it feels like a very, um, it's a very unwholesome mind state uh, for, for me and like to not feel that way. Um, and I guess my question is, I feel like there's a lot of formal practices around um, like, like metta practice. So when I'm feeling ill will, um, I, I do, a lot of, do a lot of extra metta and that seems to balance things out. But I feel like I don't often see more formal practices for, for mudita. And I know that the practice as a whole, it will allow it to arise. Um, but these times where I'm really noticing those unwholesome mind states arise, like how can I, how can I more formally work with that? Because I'm, I'm mindful of it. I'm mindful of it coming up. Um, and, and yeah, I, I want to feel, <laughs> I want to feel mudita, not jealousy. So thank you. That's my question. Yeah, so mudita, for those who don't know, means uh, rejoicing in goodness or sympathetic joy, gladness. So in the Buddhist cosmology, the, uh, the Brahma gods are portrayed with four faces often. And for those of you who know the different uh, forms that metta or loving kindness takes, you'll know there's, there's four abodes of the Brahmas. They're called the boundless abodes, which are supposed to sort of resonate with this idea of, of the Brahmas. Um, so there's metta, loving kindness, karuna, sympathetic, or uh, compassion, uh, mudita, sympathetic joy, and upekka, which is equanimity or equipoise. And uh, mudita, I think, is probably the hardest for most of us. Uh, rejoicing in others' well-being or goodness. So I think one thing that can be helpful here is to apply the framework of the Four Noble Truths. Like it's so often, it's one of the Buddha's categorical teachings. So the Four Noble Truths of comprehending suffering, letting go of its cause, craving, realizing peace, and moving towards the path of, of that peace. And in some ways, there's something very mesmerizing and attractive about the really active forms of the Brahma Viharas, like metta or mudita. We love the idea of kind of radiating out this joy and like having this, you know, sparkle in our eyes all the time. And in some ways, it really corresponds to the fourth noble truth or the third, like the path and the, and the goal. It's very like onward leading. It's very um, bright and uh, kind of has a lot of momentum to it. It's fun to kind of shoot meta rays out at people, and we want to. But then we find we don't want to, and like it's kind of annoying that they get to go to a monastery or are doing better in work than us or whatever. And I think part of it really comes from not being quick enough on our feet with the Four Noble Truths. We want to ride that Fourth Noble Truth all the way to the end, and we don't get to because the first noble truth is always there at the prime, uh, at one of the prime points in the Buddhist teachings because to comprehend our suffering is, is the least fun of the truths. You know, it's, we love to, you know, feel that glow of met, metta or uh, mudita, but often which of the Brahma Viharas we are uh, meant to be practicing has a lot to do with where our own heart is right then because it's like two strings resonating. You know, if you pluck one string and there's the same note on a nearby string, they'll both resonate in tandem. So 
you know, often it just comes from like maybe in your life right now, there is a thread of suffering that's come up again and dukkha is arising again. And often so much of that fracturing of the mind and practice comes from the fact that we haven't realized that and just stopped and turned towards our own pain and, and suffering with compassion and really stepped back into the first noble truth. We haven't cycled through the four noble truths fast enough. Um, and honestly, if that can be realized, then, you know, often it's just not the time for mudita. Like often there needs to be this turning inwards and karuna, compassion, even for oneself, which really is associated very much with the first noble truth has this quality of, it's a bit more inward pulling, it's softer, it's, it's more tender, it's more intimate. And um, so often it's like the proper place to be might be just to have compassion for yourself in that moment. And maybe that's what's being called by the inability to spread mudita actively. But in terms of formal practices for mudita, um, I'd say also, you know, giving is lovely, all these things. But I think usually the issue is honestly that we, we haven't taken that really humble route towards our own pain again. And, and you often see this with anger, like you try so hard to spread metta to the people you're angry to, but what you actually need to do is spread karuna, compassion to yourself for how bad it hurts to be angry. And that's actually the route to the Brahma Viharas. So yeah, good luck. That's, that's helpful. I think there's also this other layer that was coming up of ill will for myself because I'm like, why can't I just feel the mudita? <laughs> and just a lot of shame. Like I was noticing myself not even wanting to ask this question. It feels embarrassing. And I just want to be that good practitioner, you know, that's always loving and like cheerful. And it, this week I'm just, I'm, I'm not. Um, so thank you for saying that. That's really helpful. Welcome. Who else has felt spiritual jealousy here? Anyone? Yeah? <laughs> Katie, just I know you like uh, Ajahn Achalo. He's got a whole guided meditation. It might be like an hour and a half on Mudita. You couldn't find it? Okay, I wrote out the whole thing. It was like an hour and a half, but I... I you've heard, you found it? Okay. We'll find it. Send it your way. Hello. There we go. Um, hi, I'm Kai. Um, so. I've been practicing for like a, just over a decade and have had a number of moments of like, like I'm just sitting and watching and it doesn't feel like I'm active. And more recently, especially like following things like sleep apnea and these things that like are impeding my breath, it feels like I have to keep it going. And I've found this kind of like subtle space of like letting go of all intention and really just watching, but it feels, it, there's like this weird subtleness to not controlling anything, and I can't really describe it, and it feels like sometimes it comes through, and I'm not like entirely sure what my question is, but there's like this space of like, I'm doing a thing, and then like I'm stopping doing the thing, and then like just being, and there's almost like pains associated with it. Like, like when I stop trying to control my breathing, I notice that there's all this discomfort that like the act of trying to breathe into it is pushing into. I don't know. It, it, does any of that resonate with experiences you guys have had? And do you have any advice for how to settle into not taking subtle control of even like the eyes and the sights and the sounds like it feels related to that like this trying to control the sensations even with the breath yeah that's a great question and i think it's common for many people um you can think of meditation two general styles or types of meditation you say object-based meditation 
which is like the breath or a mantra. You've got one thing, just keep coming back. The mind wanders off. Okay, come back. The breath, mantra, mantra, wanders off, mantra, breath, whatever. But then there's also like subjective based meditation, which is kind of what you're pointing to, which is just, uh, this is in, in the line of what Lumpur Cha and Ajahn Man, many forest Ajahns in Thailand talk about of being the one who knows, or Lumpur Samedo, just being the observer. And uh, Ajahn Jeff, you know, a, a Buddhist, Theravada Buddhist uh, scholar and great practitioner will say, actually, even that, you know, being the knowing, it's not, there's not no effort there. But putting that aside, it can feel like there's no effort there if you're just, uh, yeah, just trying to witness. It's almost like rather than taking the effort as it usually feels like you're like looking at the world and it almost feels like I'm going out through the pupil and like making up some story and getting information. It's almost like hearing sights or like receiving the world. It's a receptive, a receptive process of meditation. Like I'm just, you're just in the middle of a room sitting on a chair and everything is happening around you, a big circular room. And you'll realize that there's no chair and there's no you, but you're just taking it all in and see if you can rest in that. And that's what Ajahn, taking that subjective uh, awareness as your object. See if you can do that, basically come back to the knowing, okay, coming back to the knowing. It's almost like a anatomical, kind of analogy would be like rather when you're looking at someone not looking out but actually feeling the back of your eyeball yeah so that's that's kind of what being the knowing is like yeah I'd also um, say that I think that's really actually a good a good pointer and the one thing that um, I think some people have more of that ability to step into a, a more receptive place. For me, I, I honestly, like I'm very much a doer and I found like um, it didn't work for me. And when I tried not to try, the trying just moves underneath the surface into the subterranean level and begins to grip everything and tie yourself in knots, yeah? And uh, so Ajahn Jeff says like, look, you know, we're coming at, we're creatures of doing, it's karma. We create karma by nature. And so use it, work with your intention in doing. And I find you can do that two ways. Um, one is to, uh, you know, either um, really one of the things you can try to do, a, a thing of intention and in mindfulness of breathing is try to become sensitive. So really try to track the breath at one very delicate point just narrow in more if you feel yourself um you know becoming uh tied up in knots then just try to go even closer if you, anyone's read the subtle knife it's like will trying to feel for that space between the atoms and um but if you you can also go wide and uh be there with this wide field and, and that's when you can really use these visualizations of say the breath is this white mist moving in through the whole body and if you use part of your intention, kind of split it, it's lighter. And those are really wholesome um, intentions you're, you're using. Um, if you do just want to be with the breath, Ajahn Jeff recommended to me that I split awareness between uh, the crown of the head and the tailbone while tracking the breath. So you sort of fracture, you spread, and that keeps all the intention from nodding up in one spot. Um, and uh, I think those are effective. And the one thing to end with is there's these two terms in meditation called vitaka vichara, directed thought and evaluation, which is compared to ringing a bell and listening to it. And initially you have to ring the bell a lot. You'll like have these visualizations going, you'll remind yourself. But as things calm, it's okay just to ring the bell less and less and less until, you know, maybe just every 60 seconds you're saying the word like breath and then just tasting it. Um, yeah, so I found that to be more helpful for me. Like, how do you do yourself into calm or something?
people. Yeah, just out of a 40 hour work week, sit down and don't control your breath. See how that, you know, it's hard. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. I'm Frank. As I don't know, a number of you have probably figured out by now, I talk basically every Saturday anyway. In reflecting on what I'd said last week, I realized that, you know, in all honesty, I first encountered Buddhism back in high school, but I didn't really feel like I was on the path, so to speak, until. 2020, if not just like within the past month or so when I started coming here and I realized the the thing that had changed was Shraddha. I had sort of ignored faith on the Buddhist path as well. It's just my own trust and my practice that this works and the Buddha uh, was being truthful, and et cetera, et cetera, yada, yada. And yet there is this deep, honestly religious, emotional faith that I've found welling up that drives my practice. It's clarified things and like meditating this morning in the group session I found myself sitting with my eyes open, looking at the venerables and just sort of with this giant grin on my face and a warmth in my heart, which just was something I'd never experienced before. And the idea of prostrating to monks, just sort of full out on my face on the ground, just seemed like weird Asian stuff, and I can see doing that now. I can understand why someone would do it. And there are all these stories that I've found myself telling myself that just aren't true. Like, I'm sitting here cross-legged on a cushion, comfortable after getting clipped by a car a couple of years ago, and thinking, you know, I'm going to have to sit in a folding chair to meditate for the rest of my life. And it just, so much has changed in such a short amount of time. It's been a wild ride, and I can't, I can't wait to see what happens next. So I was wondering if you could speak a bit about the place of and the importance of Shraddha and the stories we tell ourselves in practice. Yeah, I, I understand. The first, um, they call it moments of grace in Christianity, where you feel like you're stepping into a footprint that was made for you. Yeah, and I think we've all had that that moment, you know. And um, I remember my first few years at Mop John, I, uh, the monastery I ordained at, I'd keep, you know, I'd be like, oh, today was a long day of pouring cement and stuff. Um, that's what we do on Christmas as monks. <laughs> so, um, and, you know, I can just skip evening chanting today, and I just, I couldn't do it, because I just, there was such love for that image, and it felt like coming home, and um, however much we get bowed to on occasion, which, by the way, is quite uncomfortable for us, we're, we're still adjusting to it, um, you kind of have to be like, just, you know, it's not about us, it's about the Sangha, um, we bow far more to, you know, in monasteries, like that's my favorite practice is bowing to these senior monks because, you know, you think, people think that you give up love or family or uh, all these things as a, as a monastic or practitioner, but you don't, like, the most pure love I've ever felt was for, um, you know, this path, the great monastics I've met, Long Parpasano and, um, yeah, I, I think, you know, Long Parpasana would say that wisdom will take you to the edge, but faith is what lets you jump. And, um, and we oftentimes, you know, are afraid of sort of people's 
baggage around the word faith, and so we talk about, you know, it's confidence, it's trust, and it is. But there's a real quality of heart. There really is, because something in you knows um, what's trivial and what's non-trivial. And when you come across the most non-trivial thing you've ever met, you've ever seen, um, and it's not just a route to happiness, it's also a duty, it's, the, it's a purpose for your life, it's, it's everything. Um, I don't know how the heart can remain, you know, coldly, you know, just I'm fairly confident in this, you know, it's more than that, it's much more. So, yeah, I'm so glad you have that sense, and um, I, I also, it's what's carried me on this path as well. Uh, so we have a question from the live stream from Rick Thorne. I was under so much stress in grad school that I compulsively ate cheesecake and similar foods. This compulsion just dropped away when I stopped pushing myself beyond my limits. Any reflections? Yeah, the compulsion to eat cheesecake ended when he gave up the Mm. Yeah, it's it's fascinating. Just for probably many of us can like identify with with that, like having given up some kind of something that we love, if we or are kind of obsessed with, um, when we see that it's it's not really that healthy for us. And um, yeah, the there's a push to it. You know, there's there's like a heat and like a burning behind various of our different um, compulsions and whatever drug or form of um, yeah, way of numbing our, our sense of, of suffering. Like there's like a, there's a push, like he's saying, like the um, constant, it's either you're constantly running from dukkha or you're constantly running from sense of ill at ease or you're constantly trying to cover it over, cover it over with uh, pillows or just numb yourself by any means necessary and yeah if you can uh, shift your other habits and just give up that um, that drive um, just that constant outward going um, movement that you, you can feel in your body I mean and that's that's one way to like bring this whole process like into the, the present moment Rick you said it you said it well um, yeah is you can feel the um, the compulsive urge, like in your body, in the present moment, when you're when you're being drawn out through the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, or mind, and you can just relax that. And the, the sooner you can feel it in your body and literally uh, relax your grip or let your shoulders just be less tense and let your face get out of this, um, yeah, kind of like cat. Uh, launch mode. <laughs> I know you. Yeah, 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 okay. Um, but basically, yeah, just calming the body. And that's something which is really important is, and, and it, takes, it takes skill. I mean, not everybody can do it. If, if we're used to like being in our heads all the time and, you know, working at a, uh, whatever the knowledge industry for knowledge workers, we're just constantly, we don't even know what's underneath our neck. You know, we're just so unfamiliar with the body and it takes time, um, which is why it's useful to learn how to do breath meditation fully embodied. Because then you can practice and you start to notice it sooner and sooner when uh, your hands are clenching or your shoulders are tensing and all these other cues that your mind is clenching. So uh, there's this positive feedback loop in that way when you can release when the body clenches, the mind clenches, and back and forth like this. And similarly, when you can relax the body, the mind can relax, and it goes back and forth. So, 